Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Information Session, Proposed Weed Control at Gladstone State Forest. This webinar is in listen-only mode, so if you wish to ask the presenters a question, simply type it in the message box, which is located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Although please note that we may not be able to answer all questions. And if you have any technical issues, you can also type these in the chat box, and some will reply to you privately. Or alternatively, please dial the 1-800 support number provided in the chat box. And if you experience any issues in hearing the sound coming from your computer, please feel free to listen to the uh, your webinar through your telephone, the details of which will appear in the chat box shortly. I'd now like to hand over to Dean Anderson to begin today's presentation. Welcome to all listening and watching this via the web. Before we start, I'd like to thank Dr. Andrew Hewitt, Research Professor at the University of Queensland and the University of Nebraska, USA. He's the Science Fellow in Pesticide Drift to the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority. Andy Hawkins, Manager of the Chemicals Regulation Unit at the New South Wales Environment Protection Authority, and Gavin Hunt from Redback, who's facilitating this webinar. We've chosen this webinar format as the next step in how we engage with the community in regard to re-establishing the plantations in the Ballinger. The first step was that we informed our neighbours about our plans, and when concerns were expressed, we halted the program. A number of suggestions have been made about alternatives, and we're following up on these. This is the next step, to provide more information about our weed control for plantation re-establishment and to bring in experts to help answer questions about this. This will be followed up with further responses to any questions raised. We will then engage locally to address the specifics of the plantation re-establishment at Gladstone. I appreciate the comments that have been sent about effective community engagement and consultation. Important to note, that we thought it would be a folly to go straight to the community meeting without adequately sharing relevant information first. This is what this webinar is about today. The Forestry Corporation will have due regard to everyone's input, but in the end we'll need to make a decision based on all the information in front of us. We're not able to affect Australia-wide change or impose outcomes on every citizen in the Ballinger. Such issues need to be raised in a forum other than one looking at re-establishing some trees. I encourage your input into the management of this plantation and ensure we do all, we, all the possible solutions to evaluate. And Cathy, at the end of today's presentation, will discuss how this can be done. Again, thanks for joining us. So just going through a quick outline. So in terms of state forests, there's 80 million hectares in all of New South Wales, 27 of it's forested, 2 million is managed by the Forestry Corporation, of which 40,000 is hardwood plantation, of which 6,000 are in the Ballinger. The history, 4,500 4 hectares of these plantations were actually established by a company called APM back in the 60s. And it was established on ex-dairy country. And in the late 70s, 80s, we end up purchasing them. So in terms of plantation management, these are managed on a 30 to 40 year cycle and they're managed under the Plantations and Reforestation Act, which is regulated by the Department of Primary Industries. The plantations are a key part of our hardwood supply, um, especially good fawn blackbutt plantations are vital for power poles, flooring material, structural timbers. Yeah, okay. Um, so the most common weeds in uh, plantations on the north coast are camphor laurel, privet, lantana, plus a whole range of other weeds such as pasphalum, annual ragweed, coppers from the previous crop, cooch grass, bloom cotton bush, wild tobacco bush, etc. etc. Um, many of these weeds have um, very large uh, root systems and they can't be effectively removed manually. Um, the weeds grow rapidly and compete with the trees we plant in the plantation. The more entrenched the weeds are, the more risk that there, there is that they will spread to neighbouring properties and neighbouring forest areas. Sorry. Sorry, just got a technical hitch. Oh, we've lost our screen here. 
Have you lost your, your computer screen or the internet? I was trying to use my left hand and stuffed it. Okay, Graham, so are you able to still see the, the slides? Uh, thanks, we're away. Yep, okay. All right, so I'll just continue on. Um, yeah, so if we could just go back one slide. Okay, so why is weed control required? Um, plantations are a key part of the supply chain, as Dean mentioned, and effective weed control is essential um, for the successful establishment and early growth of those plantations. Um, research shows that it's um, the early weed control significantly increases um, growth of the settings at establishment and that, that impact continues right the way through the whole rotation. Um, there's the types of weed control that Forestry Corporation uses, um, there's a whole range. Um, there's mechanical techniques such as slashing, uh, there's burning, uh, there's rear forest station with uh, replanting and regeneration where you get competition from the planted crop uh, with the weeds. Uh, we also have partnerships with uh, community groups and volunteer organisations for targeted weed removal in sensitive areas. However, the scale of the operations we're talking about with um, these plantations that we're re-establishing means that many of these alternative methods um, would fail to remove the, the rootstock of a lot of these weeds meaning that these weeds would reshoot quite rapidly. Therefore, herbicides remain the most effective method for controlling weeds for re-establishment. Um, so herbicide use in plantations. Herbicides, um, and there's a study I'm referring to which was by George and Brennan, 2002, which was published in New Forests. Um, herbicides in that study are found to be the most cost-effective weed control method um, when compared to other methods such as uh, mechanical, which is basically hand weeding and slushing, and mulching, which was basically uh, sawdust over newsprint, wood chips and the jute meshing tried in that particular study. Um, after harvesting, plantations are generally left to fallow for a period of time and the reason for this is to allow the roots to grow so that there's enough foliage to absorb the herbicide in order to kill the root systems. Um, if that's not done, then the trees rapidly reshoot and those reshoots will then compete with the planted seedlings. Treatment must be scheduled close to the replanting to ensure weeds don't return. Um, so effective weed control at establishment will have long lasting effects. Um, weed control completed at the start of a rotation cycle or is completed at the start of a plantation cycle to ensure the seeds become established and uh, don't need to compete with the weeds. So to do that we do commonly do a pre-plant spray and this is best done aerially or by ground based mechanical booms and that's simply because of the scale of the operations we're talking about. Um, although we do treat smaller areas um, by hose and reel or backpack. Um, once planted, we also have two follow-up post-plant weed control treatments and this is carried out using either backpacks or we have used small dozers and herbicides in those operations are applied as a directed spray to avoid damage to the planted settings or where we use uh, selective herbicides in, in some cases, this is done as an overspray. Overspray. Now, whilst we apply herbicides in those initial one to two years, the rest of the rotation, which is 30 to 40 years, we're not applying herbicides to that crop. So basically, it's, a, it's right up front at the start of the rotation with no applications down the, down the years. So um, you compare that to all other land uses such as agricultural crops, public parks, road edges, etc. In these cases, the weeds are being treated with herbicides on an annual basis. So it's quite a difference. 
just to, this chart is a pie chart showing there at the moment, and that sort of just illustrates um, what portion of the total uh, chemical market in Australia is, can be attributed to plantation forestry. <coughs> So we've just been asked whether it's the most cost affected. It is the most cost affected, but is it the most environmentally affected? And also a question about insecticides. Uh, Graham, are insecticides applied later? Uh, we, we, I don't propose to use any insecticides. There's no plans uh, to use insecticides. With the species that we're playing around Belgium particularly, um, which is money, high proportion of black butt, um, we haven't been required, it hasn't been necessary for us to use pesticides. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, we'll just continue continue on to the next uh, slide. Um, Forestry Corporation only uses herbicides approved by the APVMA, the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority. Uh, this is the government department that's responsible for ensuring chemicals are safe for humans and the environment. And every herbicide they register has been through rigorous assessment processes. Um, herbicides that we use are used in line with the instructions on the chemical labels. And over a 35 year rotation cycle, um, we're roughly talking about 300 grams of herbicides we've used per hectare. Uh, the notification processes we use um, are outlined in our pesticide use notification plan which was updated, last updated 2013, and I think that's available on our website. Okay, next page. Okay, now with respect to buffer zones, um, the required buffer zones around streams and environmental features are outlined in the plantation and reforestation code. Uh, these required buffer zones may vary depending on application method. Um, any required buffer zones around neighbouring properties are outlined in the Pesticide Act 1999 and any areas that are not sprayed cannot be replanted. If we can't spray it, basically the, the weeds would outcompete the seedlings and that's basically would then turn into uh, waste or fallow land. Okay, so a little bit about aerial spraying. Um, it is a safe way to treat large areas. And you actually um, use smaller amount of herbicides, mainly because um, with ground-based spraying on a second rotation site, it's a very rough terrain we're operating in with a lot of stumps, and logs and debris. And it's very difficult for a ground-based machine to um, stay in a straight, um, straight line. So aerial spraying can actually apply far more accurately in that situation. Um, and also there's no access issues caused by variable ground conditions. Um, aerial spraying can actually reduce the adverse impact of ground disturbance and compaction and um, so in actual fact uh, cultivation rows, yeah, will you would don't get compaction on them actually what better for the planters to operate in. So logistically it makes sense for Forestry Corporation as it's a faster treatment process. Okay, regarding the safety of aerial spraying, aerial spraying is used by farmers and government bodies throughout Australia. Um, according to the Aerial Agricultural Association of Australia, there's 300 specialist aircraft in Australia. And there's 2,000 people directly employed in agricultural aviation plus a further 2,000 part-time employees. All herbicides used by the Forestry Corporation are approved for that use by the APVMA for aerial application. Forestry Corporation goes through a careful due diligence process to ensure herbicides selected are approved. Um, spraying is only permitted using qualified and licensed operators. And to that end, Australia has the highest qualification requirements in the world. Forestry 
Corporation requires anyone supervising an aerial spraying operation to have completed extra training with the University of Queensland Gatton School. Um, aircraft fitted with, are fitted with GPS to track the exact position of that machine um, and that position data is submitted daily so we can monitor where herbicides were applied. And you'll see um, a small evidence of that later in the presentation. Um, spraying is only permitted in specific and very tight weather constraints. In actual fact, tighter than what the labels specify. Um, when temperature and wind conditions and rainfall outlook are appropriate. During the operation, weather is monitored hourly during the application. Um, additionally, we complete independent water quality testing. So this is a photo of what we're talking about. Um, this is uh, in fact a recent operation. Um, so you can see the helicopter here is travelling five metres above the ground. You can see that it's um, going around the obstacles, around the trees, so it's high level of manoeuvrability. It's using very large nozzles, um, which are basically four times larger than what you get from, um, say, ground-based application methods. And um, as I said, we've got very tight weather um, conditions here. So um, we're going to now play a video so you can actually see an operation in progress. So it'll give you some idea of um, how it goes. So we just play the video. Yeah. See the helicopter coming in now, dropping. See the droplets falling straight down. Quite clear that, uh, where they're going. The other thing to note is the height that it's flying at and its ability to go around um, obstacles in the block. When he rises, do his turn, he cuts off the chemical. Here he comes back. where the droplets go in this operation is quite visible. Okay, thank you. And go back to the slide presentation. Part of the planning process, uh, we undertake uh, modelling and we use, and Andrew, if you'd probably ought to talk about this um, a lot more, um, but uh, we use a model called AgDrift um, to model using, you know, plugging in information about the novels that we use, um, weather conditions, flying height, boom width, etc., etc., uh, to determine what sort of um, what the spray drift is likely to be. And that graph that's shown there, if you can read it, um, is basically showing that how, how soon uh, the vast majority of the droplets fall to the ground. And yeah, uh, you can see from that that, uh, that it's quite rapid, the, the fall of droplets. Um, so this modelling demonstrates that the proportion of spray that could drift into buffer zones represents such a small percentage of the spray mix that there would not be enough active ingredient 
to affect the vegetation in the buffer zone. Um, vegetation in the buffer zones also serves to capture the tiny percentage of fine droplets that uh, could drift, preventing them from entering drainage lines. Turn the page. And this is a, uh, we got a aircraft to go up and we took some photos following that uh, spraying, recent spraying operation that uh, you saw a video of. And you can see superimposed on the left hand side of the screen is the flight lines from the GPS navigation system in the aircraft showing exactly the same area. Um, and you can see how precise um, the operation has been. Um, there's been, you can see from that photo, there's been absolutely no impact on the surrounding vegetation. It's, um, uh, the herbicides have been contained within, within the plantation footprint. And that's, that's what I wanted, wanted to talk about. So, Gavin, there was a couple of questions that came through, which I think most probably would be best directed to Dr. Hewitt, if you don't mind. Okay, Dr. Hewitt, we've had quite a few questions come through for you. So the first one is, can Forestry Corporation provide independent scientific advice that the modelling shows that the buffer zones are adequate for limiting potential drift and that herbicide particles that fall outside the buffer zones will not be biologically active? Biologically active? Um, yeah, so I guess what I mean by that is that um, There'll be insufficient herbicide falling outside these zones to actually kill the plant effectively the, and or sicken the plant. Uh, the plant will be quite healthy after the operation which is actually demonstrated in those photos. Great, thank you. Um, next question was, does spray drift modelling take into account vapour drift? Uh, Andrew is probably best to answer that one. Andrew Hewitt. Yeah, can you hear me? Is my audio good or? Yes, Sorry, so Andrew, I thought we were going to that. Yeah, you, um, are you okay to answer that question, Dr. Hewitt? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, no, I mean, we're not accounting for any vapour movements in this, with this model. That would have to be done with a separate model. But, uh, you know, most pesticides are non-volatile. There's a few that are semi-volatile. So it would depend on the chemicals involved as to whether you would need to look at that. Great, thank you. The next question for you, Dr. Hewitt, is what are your industry funding sources for your research and do you have conflicts of interest? Oh, we do research for so many people, mostly government. I'm, I'm not prepared to talk about every project here. It's not appropriate. Absolutely. And the next question for you was um, the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority, APVMA, is implementing its policy, the operating principles in relation to spray drift. The APVV, sorry, APVMA has established a priority list of chemicals for spray drift review and has commenced assessing and updating the labels of all currently registered products in relation to spray drift. Why would the APVMA bother to do this assessment if spray drift wasn't a real problem and current label instructions were adequate? I think that would really be a question for APVMA, not for me. Okay, so well, I'll come back to that one for APVMA and we'll get to the next one for you. Um, which was, there was a case in South Australia where glyphosate impacted wine grapes 1, 000, sorry, 100 kilometres away due to an inversion layer. Has this been taken into account? I'm not familiar with that particular case. Uh, you know, I mean, People can make claims of all sorts of things, but without seeing the proof and the documentation, I can't comment on that case. Absolutely, thank you. Um, how is the Centre UQ, um, UQ Centre for Spray Technology of Application Research and Training funded? Please highlight any funded sources that are from the agrochemical industry. Uh, I think my earlier answer covered that. Thank you. Okay, now we've had quite a few other questions come through. Um, Dr. Hewitt, I'm not sure if they would be suited more for you. Um, what kind of water oh, sorry, what kind of water monitoring is completed? Yeah, so uh, when we get sensitive areas or in the case of aerial spraying, uh, we conduct um, a background uh, water sample, which is a background check prior to the operation and and we do another water sample uh, 
following the operation, uh, you know, within one or two days of that operation, and then um, after the first major rainfall event following the operation, and that's set off to a laboratory for analysis. Great, thank you. Um, now, does the model take into account runoff? No, that would be separate modelling. So if you wanted to do runoff modelling, you could use a model such as PRISM or EXAMS. So that would be separate. Okay, brilliant. Um, now, do we want to take any more questions for everybody else, or do we want to move on to the next presentation? Because Dr. Hugh, I think that was all the questions we had that have come through for you, specifically for you. Okay. And I mean, coming back to funding, I mean, 95% of our funding is government, where we work with industries to help industry make products safer and to avoid spray drift. So, you know, most of our funding, our core funding is from the government. I so. just, this, what this, just let me know if this question isn't actually um, what isn't, um, appropriate for you. Is there any uh, independent scientific information to show that it's safe from a toxicological and spray drift point of view to mix of all of the proposed pesticides together in one tank and spread them, spray them into our environment? Yeah, look, um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, uh, I was just going to say that um, uh, yeah, we've got an APVMA off-label permit State 0154, and that specifically allows the application of these and other herbicides, provided the label of the companion product does not preclude that use. Uh, so that's that's a, um, a permit from the APVMA, and I guess they would have to um, uh, look into issues such as compatibility and, and synergistic effects and so forth in issuing that permit. Great, thank you. Um, now. Is a chemical-free integrated weed management plan feasible for plantations? Um, it's something that we're willing to look at. Uh, we've been chatting to people such as BioWeed and others. Um, we've not found a cost-effective one at present, but any suggestions that people can make, uh, please pass them forward. Great, thank you very much. Okay, we've just got a few more questions here. Um, what biodiversity studies were undertaken before the clear felling began? So, given it's a plantation, uh, we don't do anything intensive within the plantations, but what we do do is check the surrounding areas. So, we look at the biodiversity map, which we have uh, national parks and any other person doing fauna or flora monitoring records any sightings. And if anything's recorded within two kilometres of the activity, we note it in our planning. And we also make sure then if it's noted within two kilometres that we keep an eye out for it within the plantation. Great, thank you very much. Now, we do have quite a few other questions, but we will be coming back to those just after the next presentation. So if we could move on to the EPA presentation now. Uh, and if I could just say, Dr. Hewitt, I know that you have to leave at this point. Thank you very much for joining us from the United States. Yeah, thank you. And I also, also should disclose I've been paid nothing for this. This was just a voluntary thing. So thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andy Hawkins. I manage the Chemical Regulation Unit in the Environment Protection Authority. Um, look. Um, I'm going to give a short presentation which really looks at the role of the EPA in regulating pesticides. And I've got um, a few PowerPoint um, slides just to run through. So, uh, look, I'll be covering the, uh, the an overview, I'll give an overview of the pesticides regulation in New South Wales. Um, I'll quickly look at the main offence provisions and what it means for the forestry operations. Uh, please note, though, that I won't be talking about the Integrated Forestry Operations Approval, um, which is administered by the EPA, as that relates only to, to native forests. So who regulates pesticides um, in New South Wales? Graham touched on this issue. Uh, he mentioned the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority, or the APVMA. Um, they 
are the body which nationally regulates pesticides up until and including the point of sale. And they do this via a national assessment and registration system. The APBMA um, approved label directions uh, for all pesticides which are sold in Australia. And these directions are based on a risk assessment process. Um, I think Graham also mentioned that um, forestry has, a, uh, has an off-label permit. Um, these permits are issued by the APVMA um, and they have conditions on them or instructions which are very similar to label instructions and those conditions must be strictly followed. Um, so these, these constraints on permits, um, they can address any environmental issues or residue issues which may result from the pesticide's use. Um, the EPA provides input uh, for permits issued for New South Wales. However, the final permit conditions are set by the APVMA. What does the EPA do? The EPA regulates pesticide use in New South Wales after the point of retail sale through the Pesticides Act and regulation. This includes, so the Act and regulation apply to pesticide use in agriculture, on public land such as state forests and on domestic and commercial premises. Pretty well anywhere that pesticides are applied in New South Wales, the legislation applies to ensure that they're used safe, those products are used safely. Um, the requirements under the Act and regulation are very comprehensive. Um, the key provisions ensure that pesticide users must take all necessary precautions to ensure that they are using pesticide products safely. Anyone using pesticides must, must read the, lab, the container's label instructions carefully and follow all directions. And persons who use pesticides as part of their business or occupation must be appropriately trained and qualified to keep, uh, and, and, and they also must keep records of their pesticide use. And most importantly, people must not cause any off-target impacts. The EPA has a range of regulatory tools available to enforce these, this act and regulation, including we, we can issue warning letters, we may issue penalty notices, and for more serious cases, we can uh, take a matter to court and prosecute, which we have done on numerous occasions. So what are the main offences under the Pesticides Act? Uh, it is an offence to use a pesticide in a way that causes injury or likely injury to another person, damage or likely damage to another person's property, or harm to a non-target animal or non-target plant. They're the main offences. They're by no means an exclusive list there, but there's the, they're some key and very important provisions of the Act. Um, there is a defence against prosecution where a person takes all reasonable precautions and exercises due diligence when using a pesticide and the offence occurs due to factors over which the person had no control. So due diligence could mean making sure that a buffer zone was implemented and that the weather conditions were carefully monitored prior to and during any pesticide application. Penalties. Uh, there are higher penalties for people who willfully or negligently use pesticides causing injury, damage or harm. And the higher penalties also apply to a person who willfully or negligently uses a pesticide in a way that significantly harms endangered, vulnerable or protected animal species. Now section 12 and section 13 of the Act, it is legal to possess, prepare for use or use a pesticide in New South Wales unless it is registered by the APVMA or covered by an APVMA permit. Section 14 requires people to read and follow the instructions on the label before the pesticide is used. 
Most people are well aware of that requirement. The aerial application of pesticides. There are special requirements if pesticides are applied by aircraft. The aircraft must be endorsed by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority and both the employer and the pilot must hold specified qualifications. Um, so those qualifications, the pilot must hold a pilot pesticide rating licence. So this would apply to any aircraft that's applying pesticides in a, in a state forest. Um, they must hold a, a current commercial pilot licence for either an aeroplane or a helicopter and they must hold a certificate issued under the Spray Safe Accreditation Program. The operator or the business must also hold an aircraft pesticide applicator licence uh, and again that's, uh, they need to have the, an air operator certificate endorsed for aerial application operations. There's a pesticide control order called PO Air 1 which applies specifically to the aerial application of pesticides. It specifies that a pilot is not allowed to discharge pesticide from an aircraft within 150 metres of a dwelling, school, factory or any other public place without the prior written permission of the occupier of the premises. Just moving on to the pesticides regulation, uh, this requires this regulation builds upon those key provisions of the Act, requires people who use pesticides for commercial and occupational purposes to make and keep records and to be trained. It also requires certain pesticide users, including uh, where pesticides are applied in public places, to give notice, prior notice of the pesticide use, notification. Persons who use pesticides on their produce uh, Sorry, persons who use pesticides um, on their farm or in their business or occupation must make a record um, and they must also be trained, which I've mentioned earlier. Compliance programs run by the EPA. We run a number of campaigns to monitor and improve compliance with the Pesticide Act and regulation. We run these campaigns every year. Um, and we target particular industries, sometimes we target a particular pesticide um, or we may focus on a geographic area where pesticides are used. And we use a risk, we use a risk assessment process to prioritise the campaign. We have recently done a campaign on 1080 storage depots at local land services. Um, and but we also look at the pest management industry, uh, pesticides used um, on golf courses and um, turf growing um, pro uh, operations as well, a whole range of uh, different situations. The general regulatory approach, uh, we, we generally take an education approach, particularly where industries have had less exposure to uh, the EPA's regulation or, or where there might be language barriers. Uh, we deal with a lot of people who, um, who's who, where English is not their first language. So we do produce uh, material for those grower groups um, in their own language uh, to help them understand the requirements. Uh, we issue caution letters, we issue clean up notices, we license people, for example, aerial operators. We can give official warnings, we can give verbal directions um, and we can make people dispose of deregistered pesticides uh, to a lawful facility. We can issue penalty notices and as I mentioned before, we, we prosecute people for serious offences. So look, that's all I was going to cover um, today. Thanks for your time. Um, I would suggest that if people um, are aware of a pollution incident, whether it be relating to pesticides or any other matter, um, you can report that to the EPA's environment line. Uh, the details are on the screen there, but um, you can ring 131555, uh, 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, and there's also the EPA's, you can send an email to that um, email address, info at environment.newsouthwales.gov.au and um, that will get responded to 
or you can visit the EPA's web page, uh, which is on the last slide. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Andy. Uh, Gavin, is there some questions? Absolutely. Yeah, we've, yeah, we've had quite a few questions come in. Um, are the herbicides you're using on the ABC VMA priority spray list um, draft list or not? Um, <coughs> we'll check we against that list to make uh, sure. Perfect. Should we come back to that question? Yes, thanks. Okay. Is the EPA concerned about the AMPVA's um, decision to uh, review aerial spray practices? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. I, um, Oh, I'm not actually sure. Um, I know that they're reviewing the spray drift um, guidelines, but I believe that's intended to ensure that there's consistency in labels um, on different pesticide products and to ensure that the buffer zones are appropriate for particular pesticides. But and wouldn't there be an onus on the regulator to every so often review the regulations to make sure they're up to date? Believe so, but that would be an APVMA issue. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we did ask APVA, and they said they would take questions on notice. So some of the ones that have been raised, we're going to pass on to them. Graham, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, I just to go to that earlier question. Um, are the herbicides you propose to use on the APVMA priority list of chemicals spray drift review? Uh, the APVMA regularly reviews herbicides and understand. Um, that the APVMA website um, has further details on its current reviews. It's worth noting that the presence of a herbicide on this review list does not indicate that it will necessarily be any change in status. Um, while sometimes reviews will result in a change to the label instruction for how to use a product, herbicides remain approved unless the APVMA advises otherwise, which they have not done in the case of any of the herbicides Forestry Corporation proposes to use. Thanks, Kevin. Great. Um, Dean, we've got a question for you. Um, is the intention of Forestry Corporation to remove all native species on each clear-felled block before planting the monoculture plantation? It's always been managed as a plantation, and our proposal is to manage it again as a plantation. So as we treat the weeds, I'd imagine there will be some native plants that will be impacted at the time. But we're using native species in terms of their plantation species as well. Great. Now, Graham, um, how many times is it intended to spray a cleared block and establishing plantation over the life of a plantation? Okay, so we're talking about a 30 to 40 year rotation length uh, for euclid plantations, and we're talking about, as a general rule, one pre plant spray and two post plant sprays. They're done over the first uh, one to two years of the plantation's life, and for the remaining period of time, um, no herbicides. Thank you. Now, this is for anyone from Forestry Corporation of New South Wales. Um, is the Forestry Corporation's modelling of spray drift site specific? Um, in the case of Gladstone, it was, yes. Um, and can the community see evidence of the models Forestry Corporation used to determine the buffer zones? Uh, the model is actually available on the internet, if anyone uh, Dag Drift, so you can actually Download it yourself and play with it yourself. And you actually supplied the modelling that was done for Gladstone has been supplied to the community, hasn't that's, it? That's correct. So um, yeah, the output. Yep. Great. Now, Dean, this one's for you. Where did the timber that has already been cleared in the Gladstone and Glenifer State Forests go, and what is it being used for? So there was a range of species there. So the um, better quality and especially the black butt component went to poles. So that's your electricity transmission poles. Uh, went to saw log, which makes its way into structural timbers and flooring. The lesser quality, such as some of the flooded gum, uh, went to veneer, so for peeling, and then into the pallet market. So making uh, like check pallets. 
Great thinking. And Graham, this one's for you. If the APVMA are currently unable to perform adequate modeling for spray drift, how does Forestry Corporation do it? Uh, what I follow is, well, the, the model that we use is the AgDrift model, um, and we use products that are labelled um, and authorised for that use by the APVMA. So, um, yeah, the APVMA are the, the authorities. Um, Dean, what was the decision-making process that led to the acceptance that clear felling regrowing native forest was acceptable? Uh, we don't clear full native forest. This is a plantation. Great. Now, in regard to the independent water testing, who sees these results and how is it processed and acted upon? Yeah, okay. So the results um, come back to uh, the supervisor of the operation, myself, um, and if uh, we have certain criteria um, that we have to meet, um, and if we find levels of herbicide that are higher than our trigger values, then we would um, take action as per um, our chemical manual. Um, if the returns are higher than um, the environmental value or the uh, health values, then we'd be reporting that as a pollution event to the EPA. Um, and what, will any fertilisers be used? If so, which ones? Uh, yes, um, I would utilise 20 grams of, um, of uh, slow-release uh, fertiliser that's applied uh, at the time of planting manually uh, to blow the seedling plug. So it actually gets buried at the, time, at the same time as the seedling? Yes, that's correct, yep, manually. Now, Graham, this one's for you. Uh, will 1080 or other poisons be used in addition to herbicides to prevent predation on saplings from marsupials, as is the practice elsewhere? Uh, no, we don't uh, don't do that. Um, what I do do is, uh, from time to time, where we have a wallaby site, uh, I use um, a product called Sentry, which is applied in the nursery to the seedlings, which is a non-toxic uh, product, um, which just makes the leaves unpalatable to the wallabies. Um, this kind of leads on to um, Dina's questions for you. Were endangered, endangered species found in the regrowing forest, and if so, which species? Uh, none found inside the plantation, but there were some noted in the plan outside the plantation. There was some frog, but they were inside the buffer zone. Okay, and Dina, I think you may have already answered this question, but um, are these studies available for viewing by the public? Yes, the harvest plans are put on the web. And this one's for you, Graham. What is the cost of aerial spraying per hectare versus the cost of ground spraying per hectare? Yeah, so it's roughly, um, uh, ground-based spraying is roughly double um, the cost of aerial spraying in terms of application cost. Uh, so aerial's around the 90 to 100 bucks a hectare, whereas um, ground-based spraying you know, is um, 180 to 200, mid 200s. Now, I'm not sure who this one would be um, best answered by. If water quality testing reveals higher than acceptable results, how is the public notified? So anyone downstream is notified and the EPA are notified. Great thinking. Graham, this one's for you. Um, do pesticide application records need to be kept for ground application? Yes, I do. And Dean, what's for you? And will koalas and other native aboriginal species be, be deterred from moving into the plantation forest? If so, how? No, they won't. Um, the koalas just move through. There's plenty of native forest around the area. Um, we're planting with blackbutt, and blackbutt's not really a preferred species of the koala, but there's nothing to deter the koalas. Thank you. Great. Great. And we've got one for you. Can ground spraying also cause spray drift? Oh, so we've already answered that one. What training do ground rig operators require compared to aerial applicators of pesticides? Yeah, okay. So in the case of both aerial and ground-based spraying, um, the, uh, the actual person doing the application requires AQF2. Um, that's Australian Qualifications Framework Level 2. Um, for the person that's supervising those people um, requires AQF3. Uh, the person who actually prepares the plan uh, requires AQF4. Um, in the case of aerial spraying, um, in addition to those things, 
the Forestry Corporation has a ground controller who has AQF4 training and has also attended a short training course at the uh, Centre for Spray Technology Application Research and Training at the University of Queensland. Um, and uh, in the case of the spray contractor, um, both the aerial operator and pilot must have um, OEH licences and the aircraft must be certified or endorsed by the by CASA um, for that use, for agricultural spraying use. Great, thank you. That's actually all the questions we've had so far. Um, so if anybody does actually have any more questions, if you'd like to type them in the chat box and we can now just move back, um, to Cathy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are quite keen to um, take suggestions from the community on this future management of the plantation and Gladstone State Forest. And we just have a few photos now on the next coming slides for people who mightn't have been there to have a look at. And we'd encourage you to go and have a look at the site. And we'd be keen in future to engage locally in the field. Um, the problem we have now is since early um, sort of February, the, well, the weeds have become entrenched. So all those woody weeds that have been mentioned earlier in the presentation are quite entrenched. And I was there myself only last week and quite amazed the weeds are around two metres tall. And there's a lot of them, predominantly privet lantana, the wild tobacco, um, a lot of those nasties that we don't want in the area. Um, any suggestions that the community can give us about the future management of this site would be appreciated. We really are willing to have a look at them. I know Bellenden's a beautiful area and you want the forest managed in conjunction with the, you know, with the, the community's views as well. Um, our webinar will be available at the end of this week back on our website for people to look at and if you've got other community people you think would like to see it, it will be available on our website because um, there was a lot of information just presented. Um, the photos now are showing the, the weeds um, over a month ago and the next one coming up. I think this is just last week when I was in the field with Graham. Um, and they're getting worse. They'll get sicker and sicker. And there are safety issues involved too in terms of how we control them now for the future. There's a lot of stumps mixed throughout. So difficult for machines to get in and out. And as Graham said, the root systems are very deep. so. It's not a manual method of control either. So please review the information, um, have a think. Any suggestions the community can make would be appreciated. We will research them and we are prepared to talk to you on site once we've taken everybody's comments on board. And there is an email address there um, set up specifically that you can send further comments in and further information um, and we will take our time to go through those. So thanks very much, Gavin. If there's no further questions, we might end on that note. Yeah, um, so we just had one question just come in. Is that okay to take that one now? Yes, please. Yes. Um, so I just want. Um, so someone just wants to point out that in Briarfield there are people who do not own a computer, some who have computers enough, um, who are uncomfortable technology. So this form of consultation is very limited. Um, so that was actually just. They just want to say thank you for the very presentation. Yeah, so what we've done is um, we've made it available. We did provide access through the Ballingen Library, and uh, we'll also let the Ballingen Library know that we've got it on our website, so that if anyone calling in on the, who doesn't have the IT um, access, they call in on the library, they should be able to get access to our website. And if um, if they know of anyone who wants a printed version, uh, if they could by their friend or whatever, send that to that email address and then we'll mail it out. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Just because everybody that I wasn't able to join today, it's good that they'll be able to get a recording later on. Um, but that's all the questions we have. I don't know if anyone had any closing comments. If not, we can end on that note. Thanks very much for everyone's attendance. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for joining. Enjoy the rest of your day.